uh, this week's or this month's, sorry, happy hour on generalizability and reproducibility of healthcare data in AI. And we have a couple new faces. Um, so let's go around and do a bit of introductions, perhaps starting with Maithra. Uh, yeah, so uh, hi everyone, I'm Maithra Raghu. Uh, I just finished my computer science PhD uh, at Cornell. Uh, I also collaborated closely uh, with Google Brain during that uh, period and I'm now a research scientist at, at Google. Um, my work's uh, much more on the computational and machine learning side. So it's uh, a real big theme has been sort of to try and develop techniques that will enable sort of an insight driven design process for our sort of complex machine learning systems uh, and also looking at some uh, healthcare applications. So uh, very excited to be uh, discussing these topics with my fellow panelists. Awesome. I follow your work a lot and I guess we we're friends before that too. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Joseph. Yeah. So uh, my name is Joseph Paul Cohen. Uh, my focus has largely been in computer vision. Uh, I did a, uh, uh, a long stint at Mila, uh, working on deep learning, where I got into uh, medical applications and genomics and medical imaging. Um, and uh, now I'm in the, in the AB Center, um, uh, working with Akshay and Matt uh, on, on some cool stuff. Cool. And quick hellos from maybe Akshay. Hey, I think uh, I've been on here before. Uh, I'm Akshay. I'm an assistant professor at the Stanford Amy Center. Uh, my research interests generally are trying to combine uh, data acquisition for medical imaging, as well as da data analysis. So trying to have an end-to-end -end system over there and trying to do so in a data efficient manner. And Akshay is doing super cool work and I have the <laughs> very good fortune to be working with him. Luke? I have the fortune of working with Sharon. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, uh, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Luke. I've been here lots of times. Uh, and I'm a radiologist and a machine learning uh, researcher down in Australia, uh, South Australia. So early morning. Hi, everyone. Luke is a trooper for us. Thank you, Luke. And Matt? I was hoping to hear Luke introduce his beard as well, but I guess we're not going to get that until later. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's also new, by the way. Uh, yeah, so I'm Matt Lundgren. I'm, uh, well, geez, I guess I'm a radiologist, interventional radiologist at Stanford and uh, do a lot of machine learning research with the Amy Center. I'm a co-director there and I'm really happy to be here discussing this with all of you. Matt always kind of understates himself. Um, <laughs> he introduced uh, Luke's beard. I would like to introduce his his hair as well. <laughs> it, it was once a man bun. I, I, don't, I don't sense that is today, but that is not the topic of today's hour. Um, so I guess one of the first topics I want to chat about um, just to get warmed up uh, is not that nature paper just yet, but uh, to talk about healthcare data and kind of like the generating process of healthcare data. Uh, basically how that data is generated and how that impacts our out of the box models. Um, and that includes changing ICD codes, you know, billing changes, uh, bias, and also uh, when you want to pair data set, maybe there are temporal delays. You're like, oh, this CT matches that MRI? Not really. There are, there's a week in between them. Um, it's the same patient, but there's a week in between. So um, I'd love to chat a little bit about that and what everyone's experience with that has been and how that's really changed uh, how you've thought about crafting models in general. Anyone want to take it away? You have to pick someone to kick us off. Okay, Luke, volunteer. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, Luke, I, I think this is a really interesting question. Um, and, and the thing that really interests me here, so I mostly work in imaging AI. Uh, so, you know, talking less about coding and, and more about um, the, the image generation process uh, as, as the big element of, of variation between sites and studies and patients and so on. Um, and I think the really interesting thing here is we make this really strong assumption with deep learning that the kind of variances and biases in imaging data are like ImageNet, are like uh, cell phone data or, or camera data. And I just don't think it's true. And, and so we've, we're going to be talking about reproducibility and generalizability today. We're going to be talking about invariant learning and robust learning and all sorts of stuff like that, probably. And almost all of the stuff that comes out of the technical conferences here is talking about robustness in the setting of pictures of cats and pictures of trees and pictures of mountains and so on. 
And it's just a very, very different setting. I think the things that are different between, you know, my hospital and Stanford are very different than the differences between cell phone cameras. Um, and I'm not sure that the same techniques will necessarily work. And my experience is trying many of these techniques is that they don't help very much in healthcare data. Um, and so I think there is a really big disconnect here between what we think of as the data generating process for images generally, and what is actually the case in, in healthcare imaging. Maybe that's a good kickoff. <laughs> that's a good kickoff. I, I also think that ImageNet, or there's definitely been papers on this, how ImageNet doesn't uh, generalize ImageNet. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe, maybe I'll add a comment on that because yeah. I guess, um, yeah, we've been doing some research, I think maybe very related to kind of some of the points Luke is bring, um, bringing up more on the computational side, but um, still sort of bringing up these these points. So, um, so yeah, like definitely, you know, I, I feel like we saw sort of all of this incredible progress in sort of machine learning and deep learning because of the standardization and, you know, there's advantages to that. It's exciting. But now at this point, when we're sort of seeing it's like use cases in sort of different areas, I think it's kind of really time to go back to sort of um, sort of the, the underlying design principles and sort of really also this question of like, are we kind of designing this appropriately for the, the domain? Um, so sort of um, one kind of recent uh, thing that we were looking at is just this um, paradigm of transfer learning, which is, you know, precisely where you're sort of taking some of these models that are trained on like ImageNet, say, and then people want to sort of try them out on, on medical images, for instance. And Luke, I think you actually have this like really nice paper about sort of um, some of the confounding, like the ways that these models can then latch on to sort of these confounding factors. Um, but yeah, so we were doing this study and, you know, you have to, um, you have to be careful. Um, there's kind of, sometimes there are benefits, but it's a little bit more sensitive and case dependent. And I think it's time to really go back to that and try and understand sort of what principles we want to, to, to draw on from. And then maybe a sort of one final point, which I think, uh, I think everyone on the clinical side, um, I think there's also this big question of like, what sort of tasks we should even be designing these systems for in the first place, which is sometimes a little bit underappreciated. Maybe, maybe, maybe my fellow clinicians will say extremely underappreciated uh, by people on the computational side. Um, and so I think I think that's also something to really think hard about. Matt, do you feel appreciated? <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time. I, I I think you know to to that point though, I think that you know there there is this, you know, I feel like very much siloed historical contextual research where you're a vision person or you're a NLP person. And I think that for whatever reason, and you know, some of it's again, just from the community, but I, we are increasingly understanding the fact that you don't have enough information just on the pixels to make some of the decisions that we need to be making. And I think that that plays into this. I think, again, having the, you know, image focused research is incredibly important, but I think we're exceedingly uh, sort of concerned with things that maybe could be solved if we could broaden the the features that we're willing to you know think about and I you know and I put that chiefly on a couple big points I think one again is incorporating the clinical uh, information as one option and again that requires most of the time NLP or at least some structured data input but then the other thing is just you know uh, medicine is just so fluid. Um, it's so dynamic that I just, you know, not being able to consider priors, consider comparisons, consider change over time. I think we all are starting to recognize as we interact with one another on these projects, how critically important that is to being useful in a clinical healthcare environment is understanding the circumstances around the image, but then also the change over time as, as, as needed. And again, I think this is exciting because I'm coming from the academic side. I'm not trying to sell a product. So this is this is fun to think about and try to work on. Uh, at the same time, I wonder if some of the applications that we're trying to embed that are pixel based only, very static solutions, I wonder if they're going to run into some serious roadblocks as we move forward. Yeah, and to that point, Matt, um, I think there's definitely this motivation to go beyond the pixel like you mentioned, because a lot of times when we just use the imaging data, we're presupposing that the imaging contains the answer that you care about at the end of the day, but maybe we can go even further upstream in the data acquisition process. So let's say I go to the emergency room complaining of abdominal pain. Well, there's multiple decisions that have to be made at that point. Do I get a CT? Do I get an MR? Do I get a CT with contrast, without contrast? And maybe at academic centers, we have the luxury of having fellows who can get the right protocols uh, up and running in the first place. But for a lot of places, especially private practice, 
you may have the technologists who are doing the protocoling. So there's a high likelihood that you'll just get the wrong images. And even if you have the information, there's just not enough uh, clinically motivated information in that image. So I think there's a lot of role for using some machine learning based methods to make sure that every patient can even get the right imaging. And then we can use whatever tools, uh, NLP, structured data, vision based models to answer the clinical questions that the ordering physician has. So I might have a, a an opposing view on this, I think, oh, right? So it had some controversy here. Right? So <laughs> some spiciness. Bring on the cinnamon over there. <laughs> <laughs> Cinnamon's not spicy. Is that spicy? Okay, I'm sorry. Eat a whole spoonful and we'll find out. I'm trying to sensationalize this. <laughs> I would say that <laughs> The headline is clearly going to be Joseph hates all of all the yeah. damn. <laughs> uh, so I think um, the clinical tasks that the clinical answers that you're that you're looking for, right? They they do require stuff beyond the pixel, right? I like that. I like this phrase. We can keep using it. So um, require tons of other like uh, measurements or experiments performed on the on the patient, right? Um, so so then we should. Instead, maybe not focus on giving the cl getting the clinical answers right, the clinical answers right from the image, and instead get as much as we can from the pixels, and then as a secondary step, combine the output of that. Maybe it's we just have models that predict radiological features. They don't make any clinical predictions. They just automate the process of getting all the possible information that could be usable from that image into some really uh, processed, well understood form, and then combining that with clinical features, right? Uh, and I think building data sets where you have like images and clinical data and you want to predict from both of them simultaneously at the same time, clinical procedures and protocols change, right? And this is all just going to mess up your model, right? Because the, the different inputs are, are going to be um, either confounding with like, so some clinical change could be confounded with outcome, right? Some event can, can, uh, can change uh, the data looking at. So it kind of adds a level of complexity that's almost too uh, maybe too difficult for to make it worth it, right? Where instead, if we just focus on what's the maximum information we can get from this image into actionable information that's without regard to some clinical case, uh, but like, and then use that together with clinical features to make these predictions. So I don't know if that's, maybe that's not really opposing, but I felt like it would be spicy. If that's oh, that's I'll, I'll agree with Joseph here. Um, and, and I'll even, I'll even take that further. So the, if you think about, say, imaging today, imaging is done as a standalone uh, modality of, of diagnosis. And the imaging person usually just has the clinical information that's been written on the form, which isn't very much of it, uh, sometimes none of it. And if they're really committed, they may look up some blood test results or something, but usually they won't. And so all they're doing is assessing that image. And then their report, which is, as you say, a, a description of the findings on that image. Um, it's not a diagnosis, it's just a description of that image uh, with some sort of social element overlaid on top of that, um, that is going to go to the referring clinician. And the referring clinician is the one who integrates everything after that. So they'll take the blood test results. They'll take what they found about that patient. And our tendency as computer science people, as, as AI people, is to try and automate everything, right? We want to take this whole process from start to finish. We want to integrate all of this. Um, but I know a lot of people in the statistics community would say, what we really should be doing is just providing this information to the clinicians and they can do the integration. Uh, you know, like Joseph was saying, there's this huge complexity of sort of causal information. We've got some questions about causality in the chat at the moment. Um, there's this, you know, huge confounding factors and stuff that unless you have a ridiculously good data set across multi-modal, you know, different tests and so on, how do you even integrate this in a machine learning model? Why not just provide these really discretized sets of information to the clinician where you can build models and let the clinician uh, sort it out from there. And, you know, that's what they do currently. And that's probably where we should be aiming at least now until we get much, much further down the track of, of healthcare AI, I think. I mean, yeah, just, just to add to that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of optimistic that we will sort of see more integration of sort of, you know, different modalities. Uh, so for instance, uh, there's this cool kind of recent work where people have been doing the same kind of, uh, using the same kind of um, neural network modeling for, for images as they have for text. And so I think that's actually really exciting, um, A, because, you know, they really got it working, but B, I'm hoping that kind of that 
uh, sort of enable some of this sort of multimodal processing. Uh, but I do think it's going to take, you know, a, a long time before we can be certain that they're learning the robust kind of representations, that they're not uh, paying attention to sort of spurious correlations, that kind of thing. Um, in the meanwhile, I think there's been sort of interesting work on sort of the interpretability side uh, that's looking at instead of just taking an image and sort of just predicting sort of like a single label or sort of just uh, doing it all end to end, uh, maybe actually predicting kind of the components of, of interest. Um, now, this, of course, requires that you have like kind of information on that, but um, I think that's like usually um, part of like the clinical process, like you're actually looking for these sort of um, significant features. And so, yeah, definitely incorporating that into the design of these systems might make them more robust, like data efficient and, and more useful for the for the full workflow. Said it very briefly, but were you suggesting attention is really all you need over even convolution? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, 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 wanna, I do want to add one small little details also um, on images. Images will also change over time, right? Scanners change. Mm -hmm. Scanners um, get, we get better scanners. Um, and of course, that type of generalization we hope to have as well. Um, so an understanding of that, but that doesn't move at the same pace as clinical changes of like a new treatment coming out, for example, or something like that. Um, or just billing changes and incentives, uh, changing what the codes are. So, um, but but that is still a, a, a problem. And I've seen generalization as a problem across different scanners, uh, which is fascinating because even different generations within the same company, like GE scanners, are it, the generalization is fine. But then but to Siemens, nope, nope, <laughs> not going to happen. <laughs> Maybe maybe we can frame this really clearly for the audience if they haven't come across these concepts before. Is um, you know we're talking about generalization and robustness, and what does this actually mean? Is if you have two different scanners uh, and the patient has the same disease, the biology hasn't changed, and so you hope the system is going to be learning a biological feature, something that is relevant to that disease process. But what we find is you go across to a new scanner and the performance drops, and that has to mean that the model has learned something that is non-biological that is not related to that disease process. And, uh, you know, so the, the causal question, it's learned some non-causal features uh, or it's learned some non-robust features and there's all this different terminology in the field. Um, but the question is what has it learned and what did we want it to learn and how do we force it towards what we wanted it to learn? I also wanna add a comment on, on here. Um, I think that the covariate shift issue that we're talking about is, yeah. is, a, is, a, real, is a real challenge. Um, we, it could be confused with concept shift when you see that some model doesn't work in a new clinic, right? And you could blame it on the, we have a different scanner. When in, in modalities like chest X-ray, uh, covariate shift is not a major issue. It's, uh, it seems to be, I hypothesize, concept shift that is actually the reason. Um, with, with but you're talking that, about the you're talking about the public data sets there, right? So that they've got yeah, yeah. very different diagnostic labels, essentially. And, and so that's what you're talking about. The concepts are different across them. I mean, we've been trying to work with those data sets for this idea as well. And the, the main problem is there's so much noise in those labels that um, you try and prove generalization and, and it's not even clear what you're proving in those data sets. So totally true there. Um, but at the same time, I'm almost 100% certain there is covariate shift across those data sets. Oh, no, that, that I, I agree, but it may not be hurting the models. It may not be limiting their I think their it ability. is. I think it is. <laughs> fight, fight, but no, okay. Um, that, that's great, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> and to mitigate against that, one audience member did, did ask, should models be trained with highly diverse data so that the features captured may be robust to changes over time, just like radiologists are. Are radio, oh, wow. Um, <laughs> you have that as a default background? <laughs> I, I, I just made them just now for this discussion, so I don't have to speak up. Uh, I also have, I have, I agree. To, uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> oh my God, I wish these were distributed. This is almost better than the, uh, than the, than the, the turkey that visited us a few episodes back. This is good stuff. Oh, I mean, yeah, I can, I can sh I'll share them in, uh, in the chat and then we can. Uh, you can all start using them. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> So I, I, I don't know what your stance on this is, Joseph, but if you want to touch on it. <laughs> Sorry, so the question is like, should we train our models on very kind of uh, like diverse data to try and get across this problem of, uh, of sort of distribution shift or like sort of covariate shift? Okay, okay. And, and you disagree. 
Yeah, and I. Okay. Oh, so, so let, let me let me. Oh, so to get, <laughs> I'm neutral right now. That's that's. Uh, I, I didn't make a neutral one. Um, Maybe I, I I wanted to add a second part to, to that question. Um, do we, should we even care about generalizability in the first place? And maybe that's a controversial question, but maybe since we know that it's hard, do you think we should just train these like baseline learners and have the expectation that it probably won't generalize to an arbitrary hospital, arbitrary country, and that we should just be able to fine tune before deploying to really match the statistics of that particular population, be it scanner level image statistics, be it patient habitus, should that be the approach that we're taking? I'll call on Joseph because he <laughs> so, I, I, so, randomly. <laughs> so I, I think um, an issue there is what about we're, we're talking about we want models that are causal, right? If we if they don't if they work on some data and not other data, are they are they can we still argue that they're causal? That they could just be predicting like baseline prevalent prevalence of disease, right? Um, and and I think that brings up an, like a bunch of questions about how they're they'd be acting. Uh, on that on that certain data so i don't know if you specifically mean there's a certain scanner there's like one type of very unique scanner that's very different so no expectation that it's the same or maybe even a, a radiologist would need like a, a certain some knowledge to understand what, what that what that image is like the, the, the differences right um are you saying like we should we should not address covariate shift no, I, I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't address it, but maybe an easier path to deployment is instead of trying to train one baseline learner that can learn all covariate shifts, maybe try to limit the scope of knowledge that, or the representational capacity that each model has to learn. And we can make that specific to a given population. You know, Maybe the model that works at Stanford won't work as well in Australia, and that's OK. Uh, we'll just fine tune it on some cases in Australia. And in the meanwhile, also keep trying to work on a generally generalizable model too. I'm good Medical with words, as you can see. It's, Medical it's, three. Oh. it's been called radical localization, right? That you, yeah. you only try and get a model that works in your local population. I mean, the problem is, uh, and, and Joseph was, I think, think, talking about this is, what is it learned? If it doesn't work in a different site, it's learning something that is not relevant to the actual question being asked. And those things can change completely unpredictably. Like, if, if you change scanners, if you change where you put the radiographic markers, if the detector starts deteriorating and you get a different noise pattern, all of those things could have been learned and we just don't know which ones have been learned. And so the problem with radical localization is that you are uh, not sure that this model will maintain its performance over time and it's not even clear when you would have to re-localize re it. Yeah, and that, that definitely brings up the issue that we keep encountering, which is that, you know, even if you had, let's say you had a causal model and you felt great about it, and uh, you have this technical decay that immediately starts, uh, you know, the clock starts right away, we have no, we're barely understanding how we can implement these things in a workflow that makes sense. Uh, how are we updating these over time? How are we monitoring that change? Uh, and then again, is it Again, do you get into issues then where you need to continually retrain? Uh, I mean, we're not Netflix. We can't update the model a thousand times an hour. We can't, we don't have the capacity in a healthcare system to do that. Uh, but that is the standard in groups and large, uh, you know, industries that uh, this is their main business, right? They're constantly updating and constantly learning. We, uh, we aren't equipped for that. It, 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 do we have to be? And if we do, I, I expect to see a, a fairly long wait. I mean, to, to the extent that's possible, like I do think um, maybe um, following on on some of the, the points raised, like I do actually think it will be helpful to train on like a diverse data set, even if that means you have to like fine tune afterwards to like uh, to really be um, aligned with the cohort you really care about. But I think um, I, I would hope that like so far, because I don't think these models are causal in nature, um, kind of forcing it to do well on this diverse data set is I think pushing it towards trying to learn something that's kind of be robust, more biologically meaningful, not a spurious correlation um, over that. Um, then, then like, um, and then, I mean, maybe one other thing that's also related to like generalization more broadly is um, I think we also have to be careful about evaluation. Like I think generalization and evaluation are sort of very closely tied. So um, kind of thinking hard about sort of, okay, so we're sort of seeing like, you know, maybe even across, like there's some kind of distribution shift, you see it doing well, but then maybe there are certain cohorts that it's like uh, sort of really failing to perform on. 
Um, and then Matthew is to, to your question on like, I mean, or your point on whether we have to kind of keep updating this. I think that's like a serious kind of challenge. And I am sort of, um, I really am hopeful that we can find some way to address that because I don't think it's realistic to expect that you kind of keep retraining the, the model each time. So we have to know when it's sort of getting out of date and if it is getting out of date and we have to know whether we can kind of fix that uh, quickly without it being sort of so expensive. Um, so that's a big open research question, I think. So on, on that point, and I, and I think it also, I wanted to make a comment since uh, Luke's uh, first um, mm -hmm. uh, statements. So on auto distribution detection, I think is the answer here, right? Um, and that, that it makes it like a very different task from ImageNet, right? Because ImageNet, it's kind of a general purpose, like the domain is, is all images in, in the world. You, do, you don't expect that um, anything is out of that distribution. But with, a, with chest x-rays or, or CT scans, it's a very tight distribution that it's operating on, right? So furthering out of distribution detection will let us know, like, especially if that, that, that the distribution being modeled is the training and validation data. Whenever we're too far away from that, whenever the, the real life data has skewed, now we can detect that like the real life data has drifted from what we were validated on and we should revalidate and then update our out of distribution detection model to make sure that we're always, um, calibrated in a way. Yeah, I mean, just, there is that kind of fundamental point of does the model know what it does not know? And I think the answer is like, we're only very slowly making progress on that, so. Definitely agree with that. I mean, it, it's a lovely idea of being able to detect when you don't know what you're looking at. Um, but uh, if, if you can detect that it's out of distribution, presumably you already know that it's, you know, like you already know something about it. And so you should be able to deal with it better anyway. And so, if these models truly don't know that, then, then you're already uh, facing a very difficult problem. I think there's two solutions here. One is the technical solution and the other is the human solution. So that, you know, the current uh, safety approach to this is that we're gonna be recommending you do audits every six months or, or something like that for your models. And that, that is the way we deal with health technology currently. And, and I think that's a reasonable way to go about this until the technical side catches up. You know, the, the technical side of out of distribution stuff you know, if it worked now, we'd have self-driving cars working perfectly, but it doesn't work enough now for in high-risk situations. Well, if there's just that, there's that boundary of just the unknown or the chaos aspect. And that's why you see the self-driving experiments are happening in, you know, a part of Phoenix where there's a grid system. Every road is north, south, east, west. There's sunny 355 days a year, right? And then there are wide roads that have been, you know, planned in advance and they're not uh, testing them out or being, you know, proved for New York City or you know Boston where you know, that's not the case. I think there are definitely medical analogies there where you're sort of providing an environment where the guardrails are such that the, 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 the real crazy edge cases just aren't going to be a factor in, in, in a large proportion of, of, of the day. And, and I think that that's, that's kind of what I think that what we're seeing with the incremental progress we're making now. I think comparing it to... Oh. Oh, no, oh, I was just going to say, so then as a question, do, do you think it's like useful then to have a deployed system in those sorts of cases where there are guardrails? It's like, you know, uh, you're not expecting anything sort of um, too sort of complex out of the, the system or or you think like, you know, we really have to kind of, kind of go all the way. If you're asking me, I mean, I'm interested in all the way. I look at the, I look at the list of challenges as a to-do list and not as, okay, we're done. We're just going to yeah. go for the easy win because I, I think that the, it's, I think that we have to push the envelope and, and figure out what's possible. I think we can attack that on the data side to go back to the idea of, do we create data sets where we have a better understanding of exactly the distribution, the, you know, the each individual subtype, right? Having a better, again, the data sets that, we, you know, even the ones that we put out there, Honestly, not only are there noisy labels, as we've said, but we don't honestly know every precise detail about them. And that's something that we're trying to fix. And I think it will be incumbent upon anyone with large data sets to try to address. Uh, but then all the way down to the modeling set, again, if I'm, if I'm prioritizing a work list, and we've discussed this on other things in the past, that doesn't really get me out of bed, so to speak, right? I, I mean, I'm, it's cool, but if you're also prioritizing the patient that just had surgery and has a bleed, uh, that, you know, we've known about or the same bleed for the last, you know, four or five images, it's, it, it starts to reduce the, the, the sort of level of, you know, usefulness, I should say. And so that's where we sort of try to explore some of those other ideas. But, you know, definitely not casting aspersions at any current effort to, to tackle some of those, you know, stepwise 
uh, efforts, but I do think that there are, are bigger things that we could try to tackle together. That's going for level five medical AI. <laughs> right off the bat. Right. Uh, Joseph, you, you were gonna say something? Oh yeah, I think comparing what we're trying to build now with a self-driving car, I think is maybe not a proper uh, um, uh, equality, right? Because I mean, a level five, I mean, so do we want level five medical systems or do we want augmentation of physicians, right? And I think augmentation for physicians sounds like every, it makes everyone happier and it makes everyone more productive, right? Level five uh, doctors, I mean, that's a, that's a very tall order and we can't do it with cars now, right? But but if, if some tool, it makes a mistake, it's, it's not the end of the world for that patient because there's a physician who is interpreting that and they're, they're gonna catch that, right? Um, they're like made more powerful because of these tools, but they're still like wa overseeing everything. It's like, um, just like with um, the autopilot from Tesla, right? Like you, there's, a doc there's a driver that's there. It's not completely autonomous, right? Joseph, I don't have my disagree background, but I, I just wanted to say a couple of things. I, I, I will say that, you know, automation bias is, is super legit. I don't know how more I can emphasize that. And, and we can, we've seen the good performers regress to the mean, and we've seen the bad performers move up, right, to the performance of the model over time. And in terms of physician in the loop, who's the physician? Is it the radiologist or is it the, the clinician in front of the patient or is it somewhere else in between a specialist? And how we design those tools and what use cases we're tackling, that's a completely diff that, that's an, a completely different approach, right, that you'll have to take. And, and so, but I don't disagree with the idea that we're not doing level five that you just walk into a, you know, a phone booth and, you know, it's all, all these things happen to you. But I, but I would say that the problem is, is that the trust that we inherently place in the systems and the decisions actually play a pretty co big confounding role in sort of how they ultimately show patient outcomes. And again, if you're a new guy on, on the job and you're, this machine's telling you X, you might, you might just click agree, right? Really quickly. And, and, and that, safety net that we presume would be there because we have so much faith in the medical system um, might be misguided. But, it, but it, maybe we should address the issue why it's misguided, right? Because the, the marketing for these tools is that they are superior when the reality of these tools is that they're not, right? Well, that the reality is it depends, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, but, but if they had that, that inherent distrust, but there was still the value there that it would catch these things and it was still useful, um, I think that's like a, a, a disconnect. So maybe that's stuff that has to be in the medical like curriculum where you, you learn that, you know, where the limits are and how to know when things aren't working and that you shouldn't just trust. You can even have an, I mean, it, it might be an example where you, you sit a physician down and they, you're given a tool and then you, you know, they're given a tool and they have to make a decision. And then if they answer the same thing as the AI, then they fail, they fail the test, right? <laughs> And, that, and then that's the only way they can be certified to use AIs, right? Um, you know, this is this is a this is a cognitive science problem right? or a, a psychology problem that um, we don't know how to do this yet. And to to go back to this flawed analogy of self-driving cars, you can train safety drivers to be alert 100% of the time, and they go to sleep in the car. Like we do not know how to keep people alert to these kind of problems. And there's a reasonable amount of evidence now that. It is just an inbuilt psychological bias of ours that it may not even be overcomable. Um, and, you know, so you look at self-driving cars and, they, and some companies are just like, no, we have to go straight to level four, level five cars because it is unsafe to do level two and level three. And only other thing I'll mention is we do have some version of something like level four on the market now. We have an FDA approved fully autonomous AI healthcare system on the market for diabetic retinopathy assessment. So we can't just say that you know, we're not going to face these problems. In certain areas, you know, healthcare has lots of layers of redundancy. It's a Swiss cheese model. Um, but we are having more and more autonomy in these computer systems. Great. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I guess uh, I just wanted to pull the audience here because there's been a question along these lines that I've been trying to think about. Um, and I heard the word trust being brought about a couple of different times, different physicians and radiologists. And I think Maitre had brought up earlier this concept of interpret, uh, interpretability, which is a very hot topic. But the question that I've been struggling with is when we're building these models and we're thinking of interpretability, who should be able to interpret these models? Is it 
the machine learning folks who are designing them? Is it the radiologist who has an understanding of the imaging or should it be the physician? And the sorts of post hoc analysis techniques that we use to interpret the models will be different for each of those. And I'd be curious to see what the folks on here think because it's a nice mix of the very technical folks, but also the clinical folks. Um, so maybe, yeah. Um, so I think interpretability is like a huge umbrella, right? And so I think there's a there's definitely a component on the design side, sort of like enabling a more insight driven design process. Um, I think I think that's pretty important just because our all of our systems are getting more complex, especially as we move towards like more multimodal, or if we want to think about things that really take into account the sort of inductive biases, the requirements of the data in the domain, it's definitely helpful to have uh, tools that are going to give us insights beyond just sort of these like performance sort of benchmarks, performance metrics that people have been sort of a little obsessive over, I think, over the past several years. Um, but sort of having said that, uh, yeah, d definitely, I think you're going to see different suites of sort of techniques being developed for different kind of people in the, the stage and sort of how they interact with the, the system. Um, I think one interesting point that comes back to sort of these sort of um, psychological and human bias questions is also like, um, I think even just when we think about interpretability and um, yeah, we have to, so, so, you know, at some level we might be like, ah, oh, if like a physician's going to like use this or something, maybe um, it should try and explain it's like prediction or something like that. Uh, but maybe that actually has like knock on effects for sort of like how how much they're going to trust it like like you know sort of um the sort of biases that they might then just um experience so um so i think i think we will sort of we we do have to address those kinds of questions but i think they have to be addressed um pretty thoughtfully and i think the tools we develop are going to be different for people sort of across the the spectrum yeah and i mean if we are going to try to do a multimodal approach i mean we we increase the level of difficulty for interpretability just that much more right we try to we we, we have a harder time getting that feedback again so uh but then that comes down to the question of, of the test set so how are we performing these benchmarks and exactly what are we looking for and does that really answer the question i think the area under the curves that we put out there may not always be reflective of um, uh, of the reality of, of practice or day-to-day or -day practice. So I think that that's a challenge as well. I'll just add about interpretability. Um, I've got very strong opinions on this, so I won't go on a big rant, but um, the, the one really important thing as we're talking about human psychology is that there's a pretty good amount of evidence now that if you show someone in, an interpretability method, something that's meant to explain something about what the model's done, uh, it makes them more biased, not less. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it can uh, make them overtrust the model even further. And, and that is something we need to be really careful about. My general position is that interpretability is not for end users. Interpretability stuff is model diagnostics and global stuff about that model. It's not about, was this decision reasonable? Yeah, I think there's a delineation between interpretability and explainability um, also. So there is like, stuff for model diagnostics. And there's also stuff for trying to explain um, a little bit what's going on uh, and why these outputs um, came about a little bit, right? Um, and both are currently active areas of research and flawed in their own ways. <laughs> um, uh, with the remaining time, I do wanna also touch upon uh, transparency and reproducibility in AI and healthcare. <laughs> Um, and harking back to uh, an important nature discussion uh, um, that perhaps uh, someone, maybe Luke, could summarize. <laughs> um, uh, I, right. I didn't want to make this Luke rant hour. I, uh, <laughs> changed my <laughs> own background in anticipation. But uh, yes, Luke, would you like to um, give a First, like sure. very brief overview, and then yeah, maybe your hot take. Yeah, sure. I, look, I, I won't like. There were several things that I got upset about on Twitter recently, and and um, I won't go into the full details of that. Oh Just man, very. very... <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look at a very basic level. Uh, there's a group of people who are uh, lots of very big name researchers, particularly from the biostatistics community and the genomics community, that have come out and said. Um, we need to make AI research more transparent and reproducible. Um, I, I took exception to the fact that they did that as a letter about a specific paper rather than as a perspective or viewpoint piece. But um, you know, the underlying position that they had is a reasonable one. It's very hard to reproduce some of these studies. Um, 
their solution is what I would call radical transparency and reproducibility, which is uh, you shouldn't even be able to publish papers, particularly in nature, unless you're sharing the, the training data, the model, the code, everything, which essentially excludes any commercial group, excludes any group that struggles to get data shared because of private health reasons and so on, um, which, you know, I just think would, it, it's too far, but th that's the overview. I, I had a certain position on it, but uh, I, I've been talking a lot. So maybe see what everyone else thinks. So I had a question that I kind of wanted to pull my fellow panelists on or anyone like can chime in with their thoughts. Um, but so, so, you know, like, um, so, so I'm more on the machine learning side. And I think, you know, one thing that's been really central to sort of some of the rapid development we've seen um, has been sort of like some of these sort of competition benchmarks. So people have standardized certain things and sort of rapidly developed on it. Now that has caused like a whole bunch of problems too, um, but it's also been sort of useful in the development. Um, and so to me, it seems like um, for, for reproducibility, because sort of designing this full system by which I mean, like kind of data acquisition and collection, like kind of model design, sort of validation, deployment, thinking about workflow, that's like very hard to do. And like kind of re reproducing that entire thing seems challenging. So I'm kind of wondering whether, you know, people have thoughts on like whether there's any possibility um, to sort of, you know, standardize some chunk of that and then try and, and sort of like kind of test things more on sort of the remainder of the, the pipeline so that, you know, it's sort of more reproducible or um, yeah. Yeah, I definitely have a couple thoughts on that. I feel like doing a dual approach could make sense. Uh, I know there was a paper that we put out um, a couple years ago where we did work on a a private Stanford data set and obviously couldn't release it because it was a lot of patients <laughs> uh, data. Um, but we also worked on the MIMIC3 public data set and mm -hmm. um, were able to release our model of code, every, everything that interfaces with that. Okay. And I think like, is that what you're getting at? I feel like that could be a very good approach. Yeah, yeah so, something to that effect. Something where like, you know, there's kind of this huge, really big, messy, very interconnected pipeline. And depending on how you're doing it, it might be hard to sort of have that all out there. On the other hand, having none of it out there makes it really hard for kind of people to, to sort of build off of it. And so, yeah, I was curious to kind of get thoughts on, yeah, whether people have been thinking about that or um, sort of have, I don't know, things they've done in that space. So yeah, definitely sharing sort of like you were describing. I mean, just to yeah. touch on what Luke, you know, said, I think in terms of the way they framed it, I think if, if framing it solely for the purpose of reproducibility, I think might be just a little bit limiting. I think that, you know, when you take a step back, like what's the purpose of even publishing it in nature in the first place or any journal? And is, is it not to, to contribute to the general knowledge of the field, uh, it, right? And so I think that, you know, one of the best ways to contribute, and we've learned this from, ImageNet, right? One of the best ways to contribute to this field is not to talk about a new architecture, not that those aren't incredibly important, but it's to make the data more available for everybody. So I think if you go through all of the effort, particularly, you know, if we're looking at a large, wealthy, you know, uh, corporation, uh, if you're going through the effort to, you know, contact a healthcare system, acquire the data, clean the data, uh, you know, sensibly de-identify it, label it, you have this enormous asset. And most people might argue that the methods section, really the only novelty and, and useful part is probably the data. Um, you know, we could quibble about some of that, but I, I think that having that out there allows a lot more movement in the field than just saying, hey, look at us, we did this, um, but because of, you know, privacy reasons or whatever, even though we have seen, and I think that's the, the, the crux of the, uh, of the argument, not necessarily that it was framed well, but we've, it is possible to release data. It, it, it's very possible. In fact, it's, it, even if it's mildly expensive and even just a 0.001% risky, it is possible to do. And you know, if you don't want to do that, then I, I sort of wonder why do we, uh, why publish, I guess. It's, and I'm not trying to be that extreme, but I'm just sort of taking to the logical conclusion, how do we best advance the field? And I don't, I don't know if I necessarily know the answer to that, but I do know data is a big part of it. Yeah, I would, I would tend to, oh, uh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, sorry. No, no, yeah, no. I'd agree with Matt. Uh, and I think the two fundamental issues here are trying to release code and trying to release data. I, at the end of the day, I really don't think that releasing code is that useful. Um, you know, for the most part, you know, it doesn't really matter if you use like a ResNet 50 or like a DenseNet 121, your results are going to be more or less the same. Maybe if there's a really unique architecture it might take me a week to code it up in PyTorch, but 
But at the end of the day, the real limiting factor is the data sets that people have access to. So I think tossing around code and data in the same category, I don't even think that's useful. Uh, but then again, I agree with Matt that, you know, in some cases it's challenging and maybe as a small counterpoint to what Matt said, different labs and different institutions may have different abilities to have that flexibility and to be able to afford going through some PHI de-identification processes. But I think at the end of the day, the real value is in the data. Okay. Yeah, I, oh, no. I was going to say just just for fun, I'll, I'll like disagree slightly with that. Um, so so um, not, I, I mean, I don't I don't actually really disagree that like kind of the data is sort of like super important. Like you know, I think that's like that's a huge part of sort of the design. Um, I will I will just put in sort of a small point that like you know I think releasing code is also useful because even if sort of like the model or something is known, sometimes you're sort of like altering it in various ways, and like you know there are like all of these hyperparameter choices we have to make. So so I definitely value it a lot when people sort of have kind of some release code and you can just go sort of try that out. Well, you definitely save a lot of more electricity by at least doing that, right? So we don't have to continue to do all the same, go through the same steps. <laughs> but, then, but then that, that also raises the question, you know, uh, is, it, is a model zoo appropriate? Is it, do, do journals or other bodies just say, here's your pre-trained model sitting here? You know, is that, is that useful? Is that as useful as the data? I'm not, I'm not entirely sure, but is that another option? I don't, I don't know. It saves steps maybe in some, some cases. I think code and pre-trained model weights are super useful. I think they're, um, to Akshay's point, they're even more useful for the author putting it out to get cited. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but that's true. Like, if I can easily build off of your work, I'm going to easily build off of your work and then cite the hell out of you. But then uh, if you don't, then uh, I definitely also question, because uh, I think there has been code that's been released where, oopsie, there was a bug, or like, oopsie, something was wrong. And so I think it, it definitely establishes, hey, like I'm willing to make this an open conversation as research. And so I think that's, I, th I think that part's almost even more important um, as opposed to, I, I do think, yeah, teams probably could reproduce some of that work. Uh, I will say that there are certain papers where I've been very upset at where the hyperparameters are very much hidden in code or never available, even if I contact the authors and I'm like, what's going on? Um, so. Uh, and the figure was like photoshopped. Okay, never mind. I will not call out who this is, but I, <laughs> I we know each other now. But um, the yeah. But that aside, like uh, I'm actually very curious about what those because I'm coming from a technical standpoint, what the dangers are for releasing data. Um, because I I think I I mean I I know that like the 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 really basic surface level. I have a really basic surface level understanding of like oh PHI, you know like oh some some you know, bad stuff could happen to people. They could get targeted by like insurance companies um, and um, just like really personal health information could could leak out despite any any attempts at anonymization. Um, so I would love to hear more about that. And also I totally understand like sometimes the process takes forever to, to release data properly um, and that it's sometimes not the researcher's decision. It's like some, their managers manage it or something. Well, I, I do want to I do want to make a quick distinction because I think that some groups put out data, and so again, you know, there's the data and then there's the annotations, and mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of groups that put out the so-called data, but there's no annotations, right? <laughs> and and so then then you actually could maybe create more problems, I think, in the sense that if you don't have the domain expertise to label it appropriately, or you could go down a rabbit hole of looking at the wrong task or the wrong problem because you don't have that additional level of you know clinical annotations, if if that's Part of the use case but in general you know for us a, a well anonymized data set that's used to transfer between research groups um there's you know that's that's anonymized data so you know from the from the standpoint of you know re-anonymization you know unanonymization or trying to investigate say hey, i can figure out who this was those kinds of things i think are uh, important to think about but if you have again um any process that allows you to de-identify data, particularly digital data, like, you know, again, CTs and MRs, uh, I, I just, I don't see the, I don't see the barriers being as, as insurmountable as maybe they're meant to, meant to seem. Maybe it's time for me to. Oh yeah. So, <laughs> obviously this whole panel disagrees with me and, and that's fine. So I, I suppose I should probably state my position now. Um, the, so 
I essentially spent a fair amount of time on Twitter arguing against this idea of sharing code and, and data and, and models and so on. And, um, you know, on Twitter, you don't get much space. And so it's a bit hard to make that argument. So maybe to just be a bit clearer about what I mean by this, um, I, I think if you approach medical research in a general sense, there are two types of research. And, and this is probably true across all research. You have research which is meant to produce new knowledge. And that is most of computer science. That's genomics, that's, uh, you know, uh, discovering new findings in chest x-rays and so on uh, as a clinical paper. Um, and that's not what most of these papers are. What most of these papers are is testing a technology. And so there's this whole field of medical research called health technology assessment. Health technology assessment is uh, you take a technology which exists. It is essentially, it, it doesn't matter how that technology works. You might think, you know, I use the example of a drug in the in the Twitter thread, which everyone, you know, immediately jumped all over because they think it's a bad analogy. But you can think about any technology, a CT scanner, for example. When you're testing to see how that technology works, for example, in an RCT, we say every week that we need to do more clinical testing of these, these models. Uh, when you're testing that technology, all that matters is how it performs. And so it doesn't matter how it works. That technology is now just a fixed artifact in time. And, and the result of that study only applies to that exact artifact. If you remake that artifact, it's no longer got the same performance characteristics and the results may no longer be valid. So this is, you know, in a regulatory standpoint, you supply a single model, that model is validated, uh, it is approved or cleared, and at that point, it no longer changes. And so in the health technology assessment framework, all that matters is, this, is, the, is the performance and you're reporting the performance. So in my mind, what I would consider complete and open transparency and reproducibility is you share the performance results. You share the performance uh, data and code and so on. So the evaluation code, the analysis, the statistical analysis, you share the model outputs, you share perhaps even the test data, but not the training data. Um, and you share your ground truth labels. And a lot of groups are willing to do that. I've, I've approached lots of groups for various methodological papers to say, oh, can I have your test labels and your model outputs on those labels so I can reanalyze this data? And I've never had anyone say no. Um, but taking that health technology assessment framework and saying, well, actually we're generating knowledge here. And what knowledge are we generating? Is it surprising to anyone that with a million x-rays, you can produce a ResNet that works on that data set? I mean, is there any new knowledge being generated? I don't really think there is. And so we've got these two distinct things and a lot of fields don't have much in this health technology assessment area. When you move into health technology assessment, these companies that are producing these things that bring them to market, we, we often think of companies in this negative sense, but without them, nothing gets to consumers. Um, their model is their competitive advantage. The data that built that model is their competitive advantage. And unless you protect that in some way, you're not going to get any publications. So for me, what's being published in the literature, even in preclinical testing, the goal is to say, do we think this model will be safe in practice? It, it's not, is it possible to train a model on mammograms? And uh, that's where I had this sort of disconnect with this group, particularly because they targeted this specific paper. You know, if it had just been this general discussion about transparency, I still would have disagreed, but it wouldn't have been as vehement. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think, we have to think of this as these are devices and that's how we use them. It's how we regulate them. These are devices and we test them as devices. They're no longer knowledge generating pieces of research. Luke, yeah, do we, if, we take your, if we take your logic all completely to the end conclusion, then you're back to agreeing, disagreeing with yourself when you say we shouldn't be creating models that just overfit on their own population. Because then we're saying we don't share with anybody. Like, right, if you completely lock everything down, right, technically speaking, yeah. and, I will argue, again, I completely agree with your points in terms of this is technology assessment, but I also agree with the point that it doesn't move the field that far forward. So why not make a contribution that would move the field if that is your intent? If it's not, why publish? Why are you doing this at all? Like, you know, just do get, get an approval and market it and sell it, right? Do we have to publish it? Well, so, so the argument is, is drugs, right? That why do we publish for drugs in the first place, right? that uh, you publish to show early results to get the product to market. And then when it gets to market or pre-market, if you have the right agreements in place, you allow other groups to test it in a controlled way. 
So in all health technology assessment, you do get generalization testing. You get it tested in other locations with different doctors and all that sort of stuff. But you do it in a much more controlled way than saying everyone in the world can have access to this CT scanner. You know, it's not possible with physical devices. And that's why we're having this conversation now. But if it was, you still wouldn't be sharing that. You wouldn't be shipping that CT scanner around the world just because everyone wanted it. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think one end of the spectrum, like, is to look at the financial industry. They don't, they don't publish anything and they are making progress, but all internally. And it's because there's so much competition and because um, they don't want to publish anything that, that, that like, I feel like that's one really big extreme that I've seen. And I've even chatted with, you know, an NLP professor on like, oh, what if we do like cool time series forecasting thing? He's like, that's great. A lot of people re will read your paper. No one will cite it because no one is going to actually build off this work. But they, I mean, they will build off this work. It just won't be, it won't be published. And that was really interesting. Um, one also interesting point that you made in your um, Twitter, I believe, uh, if I recall correctly, or at least a reflection I had was, um, releasing some of the stuff could be dangerous when it comes to um, people improperly using it and applying it. Um, and because it's so easy to just apply. And I'm very familiar with the deep fake space. So like it, you know, like releasing that instantly is asking for um, a lot of the bad things that have uh, happened in that realm. And so at the same time, you know, I'm thinking, oh, but like global health, it should all matter. Um, I feel like I've talked to people who I've definitely, Matt and I have questioned um, <laughs> whether or not we would feel okay with them with the certain piece of technology that we built. And so, uh, yeah, because we're not sure how responsible they would be with it. And we're not sure if we've even caveated them enough, right? Like it's, it's also that, like, it's like, no matter how much I caveat you, I, I don't know if it'll be enough. Um, so, so yeah, I thought that was a pretty good point there too. Just uh, very, very, very briefly, about two years ago, a model was put online uh, that was a mammography detection, breast cancer detection model that literally said, patients find out if you've got breast cancer, send us your scans. And so if these models are available, you know, the, the, you're essentially sidestepping the regulatory process. You're saying, I no longer have a duty of care to make sure this model is used appropriately. And if we as a community think that's okay, fine. But, uh, you know, it is it is a worrying concern. It's not the major concern here for me, but it is a worrying concern that if these models are taken outside of central control, uh, as you say, like, if you don't have doctors in a, in, a, in a country to read a certain sort of scan, you're just going to use it. And, and if you use it and it hasn't been validated properly and it hasn't been tested and regulated properly, uh, you're potentially causing serious, serious harm. And, um, you know, we have to be careful about that. When you, when you say central control, that's like, so if you build something in Australia and there's an Australian company, I either have to buy from them mm -hmm. or I have to do my own study in Canada or the US, right? And re redo all that work to make another model that then competes, right? So it's like all this intellectual effort, um, as like, as like a country to have that tool, yeah. right? Or we can just buy from another area. Yeah. So, so it makes it, I don't know, that, that's not so- Yeah, I mean, that, that's right. I mean, if, if, would you prefer to, you know, why does the FDA exist? It exists because there were these major drug disasters that killed people. And the, the I'm not decision saying to use was made- unregulated to, things. Like it's, it's, yeah. I'm, I'm not saying to use unregulated- uh, No, no, things. sure, I mean, sure. But, but so what I'm saying is, all of these companies that were trying to do the right thing and, and uh, were producing their own stuff with, without any kind of oversight or, or a particular, enough caution caused significant harm. And so the, the decision that was made at the time, which flows onto device regulation today, is that we need to make sure that uh, manufacturers are accountable and manufacturers are accountable in a way that requires them to be tested beforehand. And so if you just put these things out there, sure, you save a whole bunch of work for, you know, groups that could be using it now and it could be helping, but you're preventing the potential misuse of that technology in a way that could cause harm. And we've seen disasters. So I, I just feel like we, we always err on the side of caution. It's one of the medical principles is, is you always err on the side of caution until you know better.
All right, so we're at the top of the hour, which is why I have this distracting background. <laughs> <laughs> um, last question for everyone. So great discussion. And I think that actually ties back to uh, generalization at the very beginning where we're like generalizing across maybe countries, institutions. Um, but last question for everyone, uh, spicy question. You're committing to video by the way, and to an audience, um, but you must answer. There's no, no not answer. Uh, in 20 years, level five medical AI or not? <laughs> okay, fine. What level of medical AI in 20 years? Level five, four, three, two, maybe let's say we're one right now. I don't know. I don't know. I think medicine just has like a really big human component. So I don't even like really know what that would mean. Like self-driving. Okay. Like maybe you can like, I don't know. Well, I think 20 years, that's like still really hard, but like, yeah. Whereas here, like there's the patient's experience, like when you're yeah going through it, like, yeah, I think the, the human relationship you have is huge. So un unless we've like uh, achieved AGI in 20 years, I, like, <laughs> I don't know what that would mean. Um, or talking stuffed animal. Um, okay, or better. Well, okay, whatever. Okay, sorry. Great <laughs> answer, Mayfra. Bad answer, Sharon. Matt? Uh, yeah, I, I actually feel like in 20 years, certainly there'll be aspects of the things that we do that will be fully automated. Yes. Akshay? I think it will be a mix. I think some aspects will be automated and I would want those to be automated, but for some aspects, I would really want an augmented system. For example, if I'm getting a CT or MR scan 20 years from now, I would love to have a conversation with the radiologist to have them guide me through the images, explain the findings in the context of the population. But that's just not feasible today just because their reading volumes are so high. So if we can reduce that, I would like okay, to. You, you can call me anytime. I, I... <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully I don't have a need okay. for medical imaging. <laughs> Let's change services afterwards. Luke? <laughs> Yeah, that's the Eric Topol uh, view of AI that it frees us up to frees us up to be more human with our patients. Um, yeah, look, I, I probably agree with Matt here that we will have uh, full automation in narrow tasks, and and uh, there won't be a walk into a phone booth and be diagnosed service available. Joseph. Yeah, so I think I, I agree with with the that half half mix. Uh, but I, I feel like we're also going to see a lot of self-guided medicine. I think this is this is going to be uh, with with the the fact that we want everyone to have really good healthcare, but it's a, it's expensive and there seems to be no good solution. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna just do it ourselves, right? Um, so maybe more empowerment with WebMD answer. Yeah, have you ever heard? There's a there's a great medical saying that a doctor treats himself as a fool for a patient. Have you ever heard that one? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, the, but but at the at the end of the day, like I mean, I mean, I, I've experienced like not having healthcare and not having access to these things, right? So especially traveling in different countries, right? Like you just somehow you don't need healthcare for months and it's fine, right? That's that's the way the way the way things are designed, right? So I think I have empowered myself. I watch a lot of osmosis and I read. I guess I read a lot of these articles now. I know a lot of new age people too. <laughs> okay. yeah, can, so, you so, my, can you take my call shift then I, yeah. <laughs> no no no, no but, I, but I think I think call, like calling for support when 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 you need that and like this should be the expert relationship but it's it's I mean with with everything there's always this like uh, continuum and then you always like go to the consultant because they know more right and then you, you consult an expert for these things right but with medicine we've had this divide that's so large and now we have just people who who never see a doctor but they should and then they don't understand what their diagnosis means and what that means about their health. And then, you, and then the other side is like experts who are siloed and they, they, can't, they can't even see their patients, right? So um, maybe that'll be a little more, instead of being like very a Dirac distribution, it'll be very smooth. And they'll be like- uh, <laughs> Love this. Uh, so Love it'll be a WebMD++. <laughs> plus plus. <laughs> yeah. I An mean. informed consumer, maybe a informed <laughs> consumer. How about you, Sharon? What's your answer? You can't. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a spicy answer, but I think in 20 years, um, we will have automated Matt Lundgren. So oh, God. I, don't that means. I don't know what level that is. Could be zero. I don't know. But um, <laughs> I will let you guys to, I will let uh, you, you empower you to interpret that. So um, yeah. Sharon, you just scooped me. My next grant proposal. <laughs> 
I know it was the best answer. Anyway, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, oh, one, one, last, one last comment. So we, yeah. we, we could always look to Star Trek to see how, yes. how they envisioned <laughs> medicine, right? And it's a very empowered doctor, right? Like okay, the doctors I'm, have these tools that do everything, right? Okay. Oh, I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not a Star Trek fan. I don't yeah, know. Honestly, oh, no. not, not cool enough. I'm so sorry. <laughs> see, Beat me out. Really, that's, how gym, we that's the only thing I know. <laughs> Wait. Okay, That's anyways, it, yeah. thank you so much, panelists, for joining us here today, especially the new faces, Joseph and Maythra. Amazing to have you guys. And thank you so much, audience, for staying tuned and giving us such good questions and comments. And feel free to continue commenting there. Um, Luke will at least answer you because he's really good at answering people. <laughs> um, and I um, hope you join us next month for happy hour as well. Yeah, thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Sharon. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye.